can get started. Let's turn to Fear and Trembling from 1843. And Fear and Trembling gives the first sketch of the three main stages of existence. The aesthetic, the ethical and the religious. As we will realize the religious as it is conceived in Fear and Trembling is of a different kind than the religious or this prototype of authenticity which we got to know in Purity of Heart. And it will be an ongoing debate about how the two, I think, different conceptions of the religious might hang together and how they um, actually differ from each other. If you want to inform yourself in the secondary literature, I told you, and this is still um, clearly the case, um, you should focus on the primary texts, both here for the lecture and also for your essays. But those of you who feel the need to inform themselves in the secondary literature, I would like to recommend um, a book by Jacques Derrida, The Gift of Death, which is, I think, an excellent book, even though uh, I don't agree with everything in there, but it's clearly um, better than most of what I know of. Um, the same is true of um, Alistair Hannay, I better write the nice name down. Probably the best Kierkegaard interpreter of the whole world, Alistair Henney, wrote a book a long time ago, but it's still probably the best book on Kierkegaard. That this is only important for the hardcore philosophers amongst you, um, which is called Kierkegaard. Surprise, surprise. Excellent book. Everything that you can read or hear or listen to at YouTube from um, dry fruits is also highly recommended. Good. Fear and Trembling gives a revolutionary reinterpretation of Genesis chapter 22. Probably you all know the Abraham story, um, Abraham received the son at the biblical age of, I think it was 103 years, I think Sarah was even older, great performance for that age, and um, a son which God promised him, and um, he received it, and at some stage God asks him to um, climb up Mount Moriah and sacrifice Isaac. The biblical story um, conceives of it in such a way that in the last instance God tells him, well, it was just a joke. No, it wasn't a joke. It doesn't say so in the Bible. But God prevents him from sacrificing his son. And um, we will see and have a look at what Kierkegaard makes out of this biblical story. I still hold on to my view that um, in and of itself the biblical story is not of such great importance for Kierkegaard. Rather, Kierkegaard uses it. Kierkegaard uses it in order to illustrate his account of these three main stages of existence. In every case, um, Kierkegaard does not just repeat the biblical story. He, as far as I know, there's hardly an angel. That at some stage in the Bible, there's an angel who, who does something. and There's, there's, there's not an angel which is, who's mentioned in Kierkegaard's story. Um, those of you who don't buy me um, this assertion, this claim that in and of itself the Biblical story is not of great importance for Kierkegaard. Um, I think that at least Kierkegaard tries to 
retrieves something, tries to um, get access to something of the biblical story, which was hitherto somewhat forgotten or somehow differently interpreted than Kierkegaard does. Um, Derrida actually, um, uh, actually prioritizes this alternative. Um, those of you who, who are interested in this, recommend you to, to read um, The Gift of Death. <clears throat> right. Fear and Trembling is written under the pseudonym Johannes de Silencio. In other words, um, it belongs to the so-called pseudonymous writings. It belongs to um, some of the first pseudonymous writings, um, which Kierkegaard wrote basically in Berlin after he, and you get to know about this in our city walk, after he broke up the engagement with Regina. He fell in love with Regina, I think at the time she was around 16 years or something old, uh, uh, promised her marriage, in other words, and um, at some stage he realized, Kiko realized, that he just can't marry her, that he is just not capable of being a, a married man. The reasons for that um, are unclear. People still kind of bother to dive deep into Kiko's biography without hardly any result. In, any, in every case, um, Kiko uh, fled to Berlin um, where he wanted to listen to um, some good old German idealists, um, got uh, disappointed about that, these lectures, I think it was Schelling's lectures, um, and wrote Fear Tremble. Um, it's kind of crazy, and Dreyfus actually points this out, that um, even though Kierkegaard is yeah, this whole relation to Regina and this whole um, way in which they become acquainted with another, one another and um, he then splits up uh, the engagement and so on and so forth. Um, it's pretty ridiculous and pretty sick. You, you will be surprised in our city walk what kind of fucked up character Kierkegaard was in his personal or private life. However, um, it is even more surprising um, what deep insights um, this splitting up with Regina um, actually um, caused. Um, and one of the results is actually fear and trembling. As I mentioned, it is written under the pseudonym um, Johannes de Silencio, Johannes of the Silence. Johannes of the Silence. <coughs> and um, by the end of the lecture, I think we'll better understand why Kierkegaard chose this pseudonym, Johannes of the Silence, what it is all about, this silence, and why it is important, especially in connection with the religious stage of existence. Okay, let's try to start um, by actually <laughs> reading a short line from page 54. The next couple of references are all from page 54 in the English translation. Um, and let's start first of all with Kierkegaard's characterization of the aesthetic. Even though Kierkegaard does not elaborate much on the aesthetic in Fear and Trembling, and I think we have a good, um, we, we became acquainted with uh, the aesthetic in a much more thoroughgoing way than um, uh, Kierkegaard refers to the aesthetic in Fear and Trembling. However, it will be important um, when we try to understand the overall scenario of the three stages to have some kind of notion or to retrieve some kind of notion about the aesthetic stage. 
Kierkegaard refers to it on page 54 in a rather murky way when he says, the single individual sensately and psychically qualified in immediacy. The single individual sensately and psychically qualified in immediacy. Well, let, let's just refer to a, a few um, words of that quote. First of all, sensation. And let's try to be as quick as possible here. Sensation, in other words, life is lived at the basic sensory level. The individual is concerned with the importance and satisfaction of the senses. You all know that by now. And as a matter of fact, Kierkegaard thinks that this is the common starting point for us all. Yeah. That is, the common starting point for us all is the pleasure principle, Freud would say. In other words, mere feelings determine our, our pleasures or our interests, um, non-ethical interests. Mere feelings determine what we are. And what we just feel like doing qualifies our self. Qualifies our self. However, to speak with sickness unto death, which we um, in, referred to last time, the self that is crucial at this aesthetic stage of existence is not qualified as spirit or puts it. By doing what we feel like doing, by going for the pleasure principle, our self, our subjectivity, our singularity is not qualified <coughs> as spirit. Or we can also say that the self does not rest transparently in the power that has established it. Well, let's turn to the term immediacy. Um, and I think uh, it, it just gives account of the fact that the satisfaction of our desires is actually what we are primarily after. And this goal, in one way or another, is immediately given. We just have or required certain inclinations, certain desires, certain preferences, and let these determine what we are, what our goals are, and what our actions will be. What is of paramount importance in connection with the aesthetic stage is already referred to in the first quote I gave you, namely, Kierkegaard refers to this single individual in connection with the aesthetic stage. Um, and I think the idea, the simple idea behind it, is just the fact that we are all distinguished from others by the peculiar kinds of preferences um, and interests uh, we have. I like Metallica, you like Gustav Mahler, um, I like playing the piano, you like playing the drums, whatever. We are all um, uh, saturated with uh, peculiar, a peculiar set of desires which distinguishes us from one another. Yeah? And in this sense, in this sense, that um, we all have different preferences, we all have different desires, um, we are single individuals. Of course, we are all oriented towards the pleasure principle, but what gives us pleasure yeah, is, in each case, different. So, in other words, we can already formalize this on a very primitive level and say, well, at the aesthetic level, Kiko refers to this state in terms of the singularity 
S is supposed to singularity. It could also uh, uh, be an abbreviation for uh, subjectivity. Um, important is not the um, name, but uh, what is uh, the idea behind it. Good. Okay, let's turn to the aesthetic and the ethical. By the way, you know that you at every instant can ask a question or can interrupt. Good. And um, the quote I want to give you now is also to be found on page 54. And it says, the single individual is the individual who has her telos in the universal. The single individual is the individual who has her telos in the, in the universal, that is her goal, her telos, her, her goal, her aim, in the, in the uni universal. And it is her ethical task continually to express herself in this. You all have, you all have that? Yeah. It is her ethical task continually to express herself in this. So, the aesthete has the goal to satisfy her inclinations. However, and this is not new to any one of us who paid attention the last three times, um, the goal to satisfy our inclinations is not what we are supposed to pursue. Taken for granted, of course, with that we stand at a crossroads or that we are in a, mor in, in a moral situation. Of course, and I, I have emphasized this the last time already, uh, um, we're not standing at the crossroad when the choice is between um, a strawberry cake and, and, uh, 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 and an ice cream. Right? This is, this is a choice which, w without being in a moral situation. So, the aesthete, of course, sets a goal, which is the satisfaction of her inclinations, but this is not what we, or the aesthete, should do, or should pursue. What we should pursue is, in other words, according to the quote, to be an ethical or moral agent. I use the terms synonymously, ethical and moral. So what the quote tells us is, we should set goals that do not reflect our individual wishes, our individual interests, our individual um, incentives, according to the pleasure principle, but according to what Kierkegaard calls universality in fear and trembling. It should be better translated, the, the translation um, translates um, um, uh, the, uh, the Danish, the Almanian, uh, in terms of universality. I think it is better if we translate it in terms of generality. The difference you uh, between the two terms, you, I will make you pay attention to in a uh, few minutes. So, we should not pursue goals according to our pleasure principle, but we should set goals which are um, in accordance to what Keiko calls universality or generality. <coughs> the German translation is, by the way, better refers to this Allgemeine. So it is of crucial importance in fear and trembling that ethicality or morality is to be equated with um, universality or generality. The idea behind it is, well, ethical norms apply to each one of us independent of our peculiar situation, at least that is what Kierkegaard proposes 
in connection with the ethical infian trembling. Um, <clears throat> these norms, these ethical norms, are generally binding. So the universal applies to everyone, to everyone, independent of who we are and in which situation we are at, uh, independent of in which culture, in which culture we're living, what kind of upbringing we have. It applies to any, everyone and at all times. So the idea of this kind of ethicality um, clearly um, is that you should act in such a way uh, which, and, and this way applies to every one of us in the same way. Um, roughly ask yourself, can your goals, the goals you set, the telly you set, be generalized or universalized in such a way that a concrete and conclusive societal order would emerge? This is one way to understand the term the general. Can your goals be generalized in such a way that a concrete and conclusive societal order emerges? One possibility. The other possibility is, well, can your goals be generalized in such a way that they become an instance of the moral law? Or that they become an instance of some kind of abstract moral, reasonable law. The reason why this is not so clear in how Kierkegaard construes universality or generality has to do with the fact that it is unclear to whom Kierkegaard actually refers to um, here in Fian Trembling, in connection with the ethical. Um, some say, and there are some reasons to assert this with, on, on relatively good grounds, some say that uh, Kierkegaard has some kind of Hegelian type of universality in his head. Some others claim that the type of universality he um, refers to is more of a Kantian kind, that is, universality which um, refers to some kind of highest moral law, some kind of highest principle of reason to which everyone is necessitated to be in accordance with. Um, it will be impossible to explain you this difference in a more thoroughgoing way. It has to do with the way in which Hegel actually criticizes Kant um, for having only a one-dimensional concept of uh, ethicality, that is, universality. Hegel emphasizes, as opposed to Kant, that it's not enough to um, <coughs> give an abstract moral law of reason, as Kant did, to which everyone, independent of her very situation, um, has to be in accordance with, and everyone who is not in accordance with this highest law of reason um, is a moral failure. Yeah. Hegel says, well, um, you have to be more concrete. We have to embed um, morality or ethicality more in our culture, in our society. Um, so, um, Hegel includes some kinds of aspects of our concrete culture, of our uh, concrete situation in which we are in, in his account of universality. And it's, as I said, unclear, I think, um, to which of the two possibilities of universality Kierkegaard is actually referring to. Perhaps even 
Kierkegaard wanted to be unclear because what he has to say um, is finally independent of whether he equates universality with a more Kantian conception of universality or with a more Hegelian conception of universality. His aim, of course, is the religious, and as we will see in a uh, second, the religious will um, make a stop with the paradigm of universality as some kind of highest um, stage to be at. Crucial for the idea of universality or generality, independent of whether it's more Kantian type or more Hegelian type, is the following question. Namely, can you make an inference from your individual goal, you, indi you, you set as a matter of fact, true universality? independent of whether it's an abstract moral law or more of a Hegelian kind. Can you make an inference from the goal you actually set to some description, to some account of universality? Kierkegaard expresses it in a slightly different way, but I think with regard to the issue itself, he means precisely this, this possibility to be able to make inferences from, our, from the goal we actually set to a description, to an account of what we should do, namely uh, to be within universality. Kierkegaard expresses it in such a way that he says, is it possible to mediate between the goals you pursue, as a matter of fact, and the goals that reflect a universal order? Well, this is true, I think, independent of whether we're dealing here with a Hegelian or Kantian concept of universality. Yes, please. Yes. The way in which Kierkegaard expresses this um, capacity to make inferences from the goal um, I set as a matter of fact to universality. Yeah? I'm, th that's a condition, a crucial condition, that my goal, which I set, needs to be in accordance with universality. In other words, I knew, need to be capable of making an inference, or a conclusion we can say, from the goal I set as a matter of fact to a description of what I should do, namely description of universality. Yeah? And this um, <coughs> issue is expressed by Kierkegaard in terms of the somewhat strange concept of mediation. Yeah? Namely, um, whether it is possible to mediate the goal you pursue, as a matter of fact, with the goals which set a universal order. In other words, is, is, is what you do in accordance with universality, or is it not in accordance with universality? If it is in accordance with universality, then you can make this mediation, yeah? if it is not, then you can't. It's, it's, it's just a strange way of expressing it, Kierkegaard, but I think the idea behind it is relatively simple. Yeah? Does your individual goal um, agree with an ideal universal order? Is it an instance of, if we have in mind a Kantian conception of universality, is it an instance of this highest moral law of reason? Yeah? If so, I can make a conclusion from my individual goal to universality, or as Kikor expresses it, 
I can make a mediation. Yeah? Good. So, if you can make such a mediation, if what you do represents or reflects or is in accordance with universal order, um, then I think that's what Kierkegaard claims, you are a moral agent. Or perhaps we should express ourselves a little bit more careful. Um, at least you, if you can make a mediation, then at least you fulfill a necessary condition in order to be a moral agent. I uh, emphasize this difference because I have introduced, I think it was in the second lecture, um, this Kantian scenario um, regarding the so-called uh, subjective aspects and objective aspects of morality. Uh, and the subjective aspect of morality is, is, an, is the aspect which is clearly um, in the center of purity of heart. In other words, the subjective aspect, it already says subjective, some, something subjective, that is, um, um, concerns the, the motivation by virtue of which I act. Yeah? In other words, um, to do the good because it is the good gives account of a peculiar kind of motivation which is, in some sense, subjective. Yeah? And uh, Kant clearly says, and Kierkegaard clearly uh, agrees with that, um, we have seen that in Purity of Heart time and again, that's his main point, um, to do the good because it is the good and not to do the, some good in order uh, uh, to uh, attain the reward or uh, out of fear of punishment and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> to do the good because it is the good Remember my example with the beggar and the good-looking lady? Right. Um, so clearly, this subjective aspect of morality, doing the good for its own sake, is a necessary condition of every possible moral action and moral attitude. Yeah. That's the emphasis in purity of heart. Now we have a slightly different emphasis in fear and trembling, Strangely enough, Kierkegaard does not make much fuss out of this subjective aspect of morality. He refers to um, what, from a Kantian perspective, and I think this is the perspective to apply here, he refers to some kind of objective aspect of morality. Some objective aspect of morality. And this objective aspect of morality um, gives a kind of precisely that which I try to unfold. Yeah? Namely, the condition, or the further condition, that if you are a moral agent, <coughs> then what you do needs to be, be capable of being mediated with universality. Yeah? What you do needs to be an instance of this universality, independent of whether it is a Kantian type of universality or a Hegelian type of universality. Forget about this, um, this, this relative difference. Perhaps only the philosophers amongst you will be interested in that. Um, <coughs> so, um, both aspects represent um, necessary conditions. In other words, if one of the aspects is not at stake, is not fulfilled, then you can conclude this is not a moral action, this is not a moral action. Um, Pierre Trembling, as I um, emphasized, highlights this second aspect, this aspect of mediation, this aspect of um, whatever you do, it needs to be in accordance with um, uh, this type or some type of universality. If you have come in the background, then just think, well, um, what I do needs to be always in agreement with some highest moral principle 
which is for Kant the principle of reason. And uh, for Kant, um, both aspects, both the subjective and the objective, well, maybe uh, one more thing. Subjective, I mean, you, I, I think I already um, unf have unfolded it to some extent why, why subjective, yeah? What is subjective about it? It concerns the very motivation by virtue of which we act. That's something subjective. We can't kind of get access to it in an objective way. Yeah? I can't see. I can't see whether um, someone really does the good because it is the good or whether he has is oriented towards the reward or oriented uh, uh, towards um, um, uh, fear of punishment. Um, but in the objective aspect, that is this accordance with universality, <coughs> um, that's something you can actually see. Um, if you know the highest moral law of reason, then you can, um, at least on principle, recognize whether your action is in accordance with that principle or whether it isn't. Therefore, objective. Well, <clears throat> this is again a relative difference out of which, which not so much refers to fear and trembling itself, uh, but which is necessary, I think, in order for us to understand the overall picture. Out of uh, from, oh, and the perspective uh, from which we actually come from. Um, <clears throat> clearly, in fear and trembling, this objective aspect is of a crucial importance. Yeah? And the objective aspect is reflected by means of this uh, necessary condition of being able to um, mediate. Yeah? And this possibility of mediation is nothing but the possibility of my action, my goal, which I said, being in agreement with universality. Yes, please. Um, so you were talking about your personal goal being aligned with this no notion of universality. So your personal goal being in accordance to universality. Uh, but is it not the case that uh, you need to talk about um, that we've, we've always been talking about how you're at the crossroads, right? So um, you need to sacrifice something. So you need to choose the universal instead of the, uh, the, the personal. Um, so isn't it, is, is it not so if our personal goals are aligned with the universality that is sort of less less uh, relevant that we're not we're not choosing between it's just so that they are both exact, exactly the same you what, what is exactly the same I, I'm not I'm just not sure what you mean um, here we have individual goals yeah? yeah which are reflected in our pleasure principle <clears throat> yeah we just do what we feel like doing yeah? we go after our inclinations yeah. desires preferences. When we are at the ethical stage, Kierkegaard tells us that one condition has to be fulfilled, namely that we are in agreement with this type of generality or universality. Yeah? You're not acting, you, you are acting in an ethical manner because your personal goals are aligned with the ethical. Mm -hmm. and not yes, no and yes, no and yes. And mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah, I think I know what you mean. Um, well, in every case, presupposed that we stand in a moral situation, yeah? that we are at the crossroads. Um, if you call this your personal goal, yeah? then at the ethical stage, um, you have to give up your personal goal in case your personal goal is in conflict with universality. So haven't we just been talking about if they are aligned? If your personal goal is that's that's what you were just Okay, I about. think I understand what you mean. And I think that has to do with the that that's probably my mistake, um, that I referred to the term personal goal in a double minded way. First of all, I referred to uh, 
to refer to it in terms of um, my re uh, preferences and desires. Yeah, Th these are my personal fulfillments, my personal wishes and interests. These I have to give up at the ethical stage, yeah? in case they are in conflict with universality or in case I cannot make a mediation. Yeah? But what I do, or what I do here at the ethical stage, um, I try to realize the universal. Yeah? This universal, in some sense, is what I personally want. Yeah? This is also my personal goal, and that's the other way in which I probably refer to the term uh, personal goal. Yeah? But, 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 it's, but it's, you're still double-minded, right, in the, in the ethical stage? Or you, that's another story. That's why that's you're double-minded at the ethical stage, or why you possibly double-minded, we come to later. Okay. You're absolutely right, but that, that's a different aspect than the aspect you, you um, uh, asked about, I think. But my question is, if you are willing the ethical, then you are not, you are not, you're not at a, at a crossroads, because you are, you're just willing what, what is good. Well, but this choice to will what is good in, in terms of morality, in terms of universality, yeah, um, has its origin always in, in, in a decision that is at a crossroads. You stand at the crossroads time and again. Yeah? And you have two different alternatives. Either you pursue the personal goals which just reflect your immediate in personal desires and interests, or your quasi-personal goal becomes what is demanded of universality. Yeah? And the, con the crucial condition for universality is what Kierkegaard refers to in terms of mediation. Yeah? Simply the question, ask yourself, well, is, is what you do in accordance with um, what everyone should do, yeah? or with this expression of universality, or is it not? If it is, then you um, set universal goals, which are not your personal goals here, yeah? but which, nevertheless, even though you realize universal and Kirchhoff express themselves in such a way, but of course, this is also not unpersonal in, in some sense. Yeah? That is what you want. That is what you, how you set your goal. Okay, yeah? That, yeah, that makes it clear. Yeah? yeah? Okay, good. Any other question? Yes, please. Well, kind of to go off of that, so we asked the question, can your goals be generalized in such a way that a concrete societal order emerges? So if someone had a personal goal for the betterment of society, or one that had some personal goal that they wanted to better society, they would be in the ethical stage. Someone in the aesthetic stage would never have a personal goal that would better society. It would only be a selfish goal. Yes. If you take for granted that um, Kierkegaard mainly refers to this Hegelian type of universality, then um, uh, I, I, I just say yes to, to, to your question, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, each of the terms you use could be problematized, but this would confuse you uh, unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. So this is precisely what is at stake, yes, if you take for granted a uh, Hegelian uh, type of uh, universality or, or generality. And obviously, uh, for Hegel, it seems that um, the way in which your particular culture is set up, which kind of norms, which kind of practices, which kinds of habits um, are um, valid in this culture, have a stronger importance than for Kant, for whom the, the, the historical, um, situational, um, background is actually not important at all. Yeah? It doesn't matter in what culture you're brought up with, which kind of norms you might have internalized, and so on and so forth. The, the crucial thing is, um, it's just reason. Is what you are doing, or what you're supposed to do, on this level, 
in accordance with some kind of abstract moral law, some kind of abstract account of reason, or is it not? And that's the difference between these two possibilities to understand universality, respectively, generality. Any more questions? Then I think we have earned a little break.